Hey class, welcome to Advantage. I'm Dr. Scott Adamson, and today I am really extra super excited because if you've never thought about the derivative of e to the x before, this is gonna be a life-changing day for you. We are gonna explore the derivative as a function uh, for the function e to the x. So first of all, let's examine this function graphically just so you can start to see why I'm so excited about this particular function. So here on the board, I have a roughed out sketch of the function uh, e to the x. I hope this is a familiar exponential growth curve that you've seen before. But now let's focus on the derivative of this function. Keep in mind that the derivative measures for us the rate of change at an instant. It measures for us, sometimes we call it the slope of the curve at a point. And we're gonna just map little by little the slope of this curve to its derivative function. Just to get things started, let's start over here on the left side. Imagine for some relatively negative values of x, like say right here. If I was to increase x by just a little bit, my function's only gonna increase by a tiny amount. Therefore, the derivative out here would be pretty small. So on this graph, thinking about the derivative, for that x quantity of wherever I am out here, some relatively large negative value for x, I'm gonna have a derivative result that's pretty small. Now let's slowly move our way across the horizontal or the x-axis here. Suppose we get to here, where x is a not as negative. For this not as negative value for x, if I increase x by a little bit, the function increases by just a little bit. Maybe more than it did over here, but really not that much more. So again, over here, as I'm mapping out the derivative values for that not as negative value for x, I get a derivative value that's just a little bit greater than it was before, let's say about that. Let's move over a little bit more. Now, you could imagine doing this for lots of values for x, and for all of the values of x in here, we're gonna see that small changes in x result in pretty small changes in the function values. Now, things change a little bit once we get on the positive side, but let's just for fun, let's start at zero or, or continue at zero. At zero, if we increase x by a little bit, my function increases by at least dramatically more than it did over here. And so when x is zero, my derivative value is gonna be something more than it was previously. And as x continues to increase, we increase x by a little bit, how does the function increase? We increase x by a little bit, how does the function increase? We increase x by a little bit, how does the function increase? I hope you get the idea that as x increases, small changes in x result in more and more and more greater increase in the output, the function values. And so over here in my derivative, as x increases, those derivative values are going to increase more and more and more and more. And so the, just qualitatively speaking, the shape of this derivative curve looks very suspiciously like the function we started with. Hmm. Now you see why I'm so excited. There's something special going on here where the derivative function looks very much like the function we started with. So we're gonna have to explore this some more. And the way we're gonna explore it some more is we're gonna have to look at the definition of derivative. Keep in mind that the, def the definition of derivative was we take the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h we're gonna explore that definition of derivative and see if this uh, graph that we're kind of sketching out makes sense. So you've seen some evidence that perhaps the derivative of the function e to the x is e to the x. But I want you to explore this a little bit more using Desmos. So notice so far in Desmos, I've entered the function f of x equals e to the x. There it is, the beautiful exponential growth curve in green. I'm going to turn on now the derivative function. Now notice I'm again using the limit definition of derivative. I'm going to call that derivative g of x in Desmos. And remember the definition of derivative is f, to f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. So in our case, e to the x plus h minus e to the x, the f of x function, all over h.
What we'd like to explore is what happens to that function, that derivative function, as h approaches but is not equal to zero. So over there in purple you see that function and as h approaches zero, that purple function, notice the graph please, I'm sliding h, getting closer and closer and closer to zero, and as h gets closer and closer to zero, that purple derivative graph gets closer and closer and closer to the green function f of x equals e to the x. So yeah, we can see evidence graphically that the derivative of e to the x is in fact e to the x. Now just to confirm that, on, if you look to the left here on Desmos, I've got two values showing g of a, so this is the slider a. So I can insert any input value I like, like say negative 6.3, and I can, or Desmos will, input that function, input that value into the function g, which is the derivative function, and it will input that value into f, the original function f of x equals e to the x. So what I want you to see here is indeed, at different values of a, the derivative output, the slope of the curve, is equivalent to the function value itself. Now, if h is not getting really, really, really close to zero, then notice those values are not the same. But the idea of the derivative is f of x plus h minus f of x all over h as h gets closer and closer to zero. So notice as h gets closer and closer to zero, the derivative output and the function output are nearly the same for all values of a. Now if I came in here and made h just by hand, made h really, really close to zero. Notice the values here are even closer to being the same. But the idea here is, remember, this is a dyna dynamic situation. The derivative only exists as h gets really, really, really close to zero. So, probably, you're pretty well convinced now that the derivative of e to the x really is e to the x. The Desmos simulation allows you to see how that works out. But now let's take it a little more old school here. Let's go back to that limit definition of derivative and see how it plays out um, from a more old school point of view. So the limit definition derivative, we first need to find f of x plus h. Remember our function is f of x equals e to the x. And so f of x plus h is going to be e to the x plus h. And then we subtract f of x, we subtract the function e to the x itself, and divide all that by h. Now sometimes students make the error of saying, well, let's just substitute 0 in for h. And when they do that, look what happens. If, if we just substitute 0 in for h, x plus 0 is x, e to the x minus e to the x is 0, we substitute 0 in for h, this thing just becomes 0 over 0. But that's not the point. And we're not substituting 0 in for h. We're allowing h to get really, really, really close to 0. So we have to do better exploration than that to see what happens in this limit. So let's apply, first of all, a little bit of algebra. Notice here we have e to the x plus h. We can algebraically write equivalently e to the x times e to the h. Let me uh, remind you of a, a rule of exponents that you've probably applied a thousand times in your life, that if you have a base of any common base, like e in this case, if you have e to an exponent multiplied by e to an exponent, you could simplify that expression by saying e to the x plus h. We're just doing that in reverse. This is typically we start here and express it this way. We're now going to start here as e to a sum, and we're going to express that as a product. You'll see why in just a minute. When we express that uh, rule of exponents that way, what we now have is a common factor of e to the x. So in our next move, we're going to factor out that e to the x. So factor out e to the x multiplies by e to the h. When you factor out e to the x, we're left with 1, and we divide all that by h. Now notice, we are just interested in what happens as h gets closer and closer and closer, infinitesimally close to zero. We now have this e to the x factor 
that's not impacted by the limit as h goes to zero. So the limit property allows us to just pull that e to the x out and say, let's see what happens as h goes to zero for this quotient over here. So we, we bring out that e to the x as a factor, and we will now examine the limit as h approaches zero of e to the h minus one all over h. Now again, if we erroneously say, we'll just substitute zero in for h, e to the zero is one, one minus one is zero, divided by zero, we still have zero over zero. That's not how we think about limits. We want to think what happens as h gets really, really close to zero. So we're going to pause here for a minute, go back to Desmos, and explore that limit. So you've reached the point in the proof where we need to examine the limit as h approaches zero of e to the h minus one all over h. We're going to use Desmos to explore that. But first, before we do, I want to be clear. Sometimes students get confused with what we're actually examining here. We are not examining the original function y equals e to the x, which we see here in blue. What we're examining is that limit that emerged from the limit definition. Go back to the notes, please, and make sure you're clear that we're looking at e to the h minus 1 all over h. As h gets closer and closer to 0, we are not examining the function y equals e to the x. Let me get rid of it. So notice as h approaches 0, as the input quantity approaches 0, the output quantity seems to be getting closer and closer to 1. Now we can see that here on the graph. I've just selected a few values. Notice when x is 0.75, it out, that e to the h minus 1 over h outputs about 1.5. When we input 0.5, the output is 1.297. When we input 0.2, the input is about 1.1. And here it says 0, 1, although that's not really the case. There's some rounding going on there. In fact, that point that you see there aligns with this point. The point that I just clicked on, rounded off on the graphical screen over there, is the point 0 0.0000001, Because in fact, at an input value of 0, the output is undefined, because it's 0 over 0. So the evidence that we see here, I think quite clearly, is that as the input quantity gets closer and closer to 0, the output quantity gets closer and closer and closer to 1. Now remember, this is not as close to 0 as 1 could be. Imagine we just go, we keep putting in zeros there. Now, computationally, machines sometimes struggle when you start putting in that many zeros. But we just want to think evidence. The evidence seems to suggest that as the input quantity gets closer to zero, the output quantity gets closer to one. We can see that as we zoom in. As the input quantity down here gets closer to zero, the output quantity gets closer to one. And you can zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. Notice now we have zoomed into a place where the input quantity varies from negative 0 0.0005 to positive 0 0.0005. And that output seems to be closer and closer and closer and closer to one. Now here you start to see it. Remember that 0 0.0000001 outputting a 1.0005, that's that point right there. So again, we want to get the idea, just the evidence suggests that as my input quantities get closer and closer to zero, my output quantities seem to be getting closer and closer to one. Let's go back to our proof and see how that wraps up the proof. So I hope with Desmos, you are fully convinced that as h gets close to zero, but not as equal to zero, as h gets really, really, really close to zero, this limit just approaches and gets closer and closer to one, which is why this e to the x is really an amazing thing. Remember, e is this number, 2.71828, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the derivative of e to the x from our limit definition is just e to the x times one, or just e to the x. So. From now on in your calculus course, if you're dealing with the function e to the x and you need to find the derivative of that function, it's just e to the x.